Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Um, I've done a little bit of work in the uh, past with the Struck Foundation, so I'm very happy to see you here. Um, thanks for welcoming me here, me here today. So I do this talk a lot for all different chronic illnesses, and especially cancer. Mm -hmm. My background, uh, I'm an oncology nurse by training for over 40 years of oncology nursing. However, cancer is a chronic condition, uh, like many other chronic conditions. And so sleep is so important, regardless of what our medical issues are, right? So that's what I'm going to go through today. I would like for this to be interactive. So if you have questions for me along the way, please interrupt and stop me. That would be just fine. So, well, maybe we'll start. There we go. So some of the uh, objectives for today's talk are why is sleep so important? What happens during sleep? Common sleep problems? Causes of some of those sleep problems and approaches to better sleep. That's probably what everyone's most interested in is the approaches to better sleep. Now, why is sleep so important? Well, we know that restful and adequate sleep provides foundation for optimal performance or participation and engagement in daily life. In other words, it means we need quality sleep to have the most quality of life. Uh huh. Is there a question? A question? Sure. <laughs> of course. This is better. Okay, sure, I'll be happy to. So anyway, we need sleep to enhance our quality of life or to live quality of life. If we don't have enough sleep, our day kind of disintegrates, right? We've all been there. And as Sarah was saying, that could have been last night or this morning, we may have all been there. So what happens when we don't get enough sleep? They call that sleep insufficiency. And according to the CDC, um, lack of sleep is linked to motor vehicle crashes, industrial accidents, increased healthcare utilization because we feel poorly, and obviously decreased work productivity. So um, we're so used to hearing about CDC with COVID, aren't we? I mean, they were all over COVID every day. But actually, CDC has interest in our and the health of the American citizen. And sleep is a huge concern for the CDC. They're doing much work in there. So if you want to know more about the latest with sleep, you can look at cdc.gov and um, you can find out all kinds of things there. But the CDC is really taking a close look at that the sleep habits of U.S. citizens. And we also know, just as I said, with um, lack of sleep causes, increased motor vehicle accidents, and um, some of those things I just had looked at, there is also been historical uh, death of accidents that have occurred, and they did have a link to lack of sleep. Maybe an uh, indirect link, but it was a, direct, a link to lack of sleep or sleep deprivation. That is Chernobyl. We all do you remember Ch Chernobyl? Yeah. Um, okay, that was one of them. The space shuttle Challenger explosion, another one. The Exxon Valdez oil spill, another one. So we can see this just gives us a glimpse of why it is so important for our sleep. And then we know that, like in the Major League uh, Baseball, the circadian benefit, or this, our circadian rhythm, which is our performance and our sleep habits, our internal clock is bigger than the home field advantage. We know that. And that's why most football games are set on Monday night, from Monday night football or Sunday night football, because our bodies are most awake at that time. And um, so there's many, many studies behind performance of athletes. But again, I remind you that the CDC is concerned about our performance as U.S. citizens. So it's just not about the athletes and who's going to get to the Super Bowl, right? Even though I do have a, uh, I do think I know who that would be. But <laughs> besides that, um, the CDC is interested in all of it. So let's look at chronic diseases and sleep and insufficiency. So this is like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I'm sorry for the pausing, anyone's view. Um, so 
So hypertension, diabetes, depression, obesity, cancer, early mortality, early death, or reduced quality of life and productivity. So sometimes hypertension will lead to lack of sleep or diabetes or any of those conditions, depression, or is it the hypertension that causes them to have lack of sleep? A lot of times we worry about our health conditions, right? Especially these chronic conditions listed. And that may interfere with my So it could be one or the other that um, I don't know which exactly comes first all the time, but we do know that these chronic diseases have interfered with sleep insufficiency. And um, again, back to the CDC, um, sleep is one of the most powerful pillars of good health. The CDC recognizes that. And in their studies, they know that only one out of three Americans say they get sufficient sleep on a regular basis. So we can see why it's so important to them. The majority of people do not get sufficient sleep. And I'm going to talk about what is sufficient sleep. So let me go into stroke a little bit. We know that stroke is a leading cause of disability and mortality all over the world. We know that due to the aging population, the incidence of stroke is rising significantly and it's led to significant challenges for our patients. And there's traditional risk factors that we look at with stroke or the probability of stroke, such as age, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, AFib, those are all ones big ones. So sleep disorders now is known as a potential risk factor. And um, it, sleep disorders is an independent risk factor for stroke. And now they're looking at it more and more, the sleep patterns and stroke. Some of the common types of sleep disturbances uh, with the stroke are insomnia or hypersomnia, which is sleep too much, breathing-related sleep disorders, and parasomnias, and I'm going to talk about that. That is a catch-all term used for unusual behaviors that people experience prior to falling asleep or while they're asleep or while they're trying to wake up from their sleep. These behaviors uh, vary considerably in terms of characteristics and severity. Some people may have very mild um, forms of this. Some may have uh, the opposite degree. But some of the common things are sleepwalking, sleep paralysis, or night terrors. It's more common in children than adults, but these behaviors have been reported in all age groups. Uh huh. It's sleep paralysis. Um, inability to move your like. You know, um, you want to move your body when you're sleeping. Have you ever had a bad dream and you you feel like you want to move and you can't move? It's like that. Sleep paralysis is inability to move. Are you waking up? You're trying to wake up. Mm -hmm. And these are uh, some of the parasomnias that have been identified. I'm going to talk about REM sleep and non-REM sleep in a second, but it, you don't need to worry too much right about that right now. But what I wanted to show you was that um, are these three different areas here. The first one, the non-room sleep related, um, is your confused, confusional arousal. That means when you wake up, you're confused. Where am I? What is today? That kind of thing. It could be sleepwalking, night terrors, and sleep-related sexual abnormal behavior. Also, on the REM-related sleep, it could be, um, that includes um, such as things like the sleep paralysis or nightmare disorder. And then the last one, um, which is, I don't, can't see, oops, whoops, oops. Or I think it's, um, I think that's just the third of the catch-all category. And that includes exploding head syndrome. Um, that is like, maybe some of you have experienced that uh, because these all can be related to, you. Um, to, related to stroke. But exploding head is when you have like, your head is going to explode. That's what it feels like. Just this throbbing, you wake up and you feel like your head is going to explode. Also hallucinations and bedwetting. Okay. So again, I wanted to point out, go back for just a second to traditional risk factors for stroke. 
And my blocking is in people's view. If I'm young, please just go like this and I'll see that. Um, traditional risk factors are a fib or atrial fib when our heart beat goes into a very fast pace and is not strong. Um, over 65 years of age, high blood pressure, heart disease, coronary artery stenosis or closing, narrowing of our arteries as uh, carotid in our neck, and tobacco use, diabetes, and high method or cholesterol, high cholesterol. But again, there's increasing evidence that sleep disorders are being tied into stroke risk factors. And those include insomnia or hypersomnia, as I mentioned earlier, sleep related movement disorders. Um, we know now <clears throat> the research is showing us that that can be a prerequisite to um, strokes or a risk factor we need to pay attention to. So we need to identify and treat those sleep disorders um, as a risk modification or before people have strokes. It's important to tell your family members and to your friends that make them aware of that. If there are safe problems, we should be addressing those with our provider. And all the information is from the um, National Health Institute of Health, NDC, our federal government dollars going to our health of the US citizen. And another risk factor I want to point out is depression. So depression after stroke is, is prevalent and sometimes related to sleep disorders. It's important that we treat that depression. And I don't always need medication. I'm not one to just start medicine at everything. There's um, some cognitive behavior changes that we could do and better sleep patterns, different things like, or better um, stress relievers that we could do to help relieve that depression. But we do not want stroke patients to be living with depression. We want to help relieve some of that. Now, let's get into sleep. What happens when I sleep? So you can see up here, I'm going to block some of you, I'm sure. But here I fall asleep. Here's uh, the beginning of the night. So we fall asleep. We go into a light sleep stage one, two, three, four, until we get to our deepest sleep in stage four. So here we start, we go down. This is non REM. Then we get up to REM, which is just um, the, the deepness of our sleep. That's, you don't be too concerned about it. But if we just show that, we go through different cycles during the night, all of us do. And so then we go to room, and then again, we start going down to our deepest sleep, and we go up, and then we go down, and we go up. And notice, as our morning approaches for, and I'm not saying everyone sleeps at night, we have a lot of people that work night shifts, so their sleep pattern is the same as it, but they may be waking up in the evening and not the night, so whenever you go to sleep, after trying to wake up over well, here, you can see that those cycles here it is very long, long, shorter, short, shorter, shorter, until we wake up over there. So that's what your night looks like. And you can also see this rim where we have dreams and um, different things. It gets longer as the night goes on. So it's you know, the first sleep cycle has been a shorter rim, longer, 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 longer. That's why it's sometimes hard to get ourselves awake in the morning, right? I experience that too. So that's what your normal sleep pattern looks like. Um, that's what we all go through. And another way of saying it is, um, instead of looking at that grid where I showed you each step, stage one, you're back there where you're falling asleep, that's when you start nodding off within seconds. And but you're you're instantly, you can be easily aroused. My mom used to do this all the time. She said, I, I just take a cat nap. I wasn't asleep. Yes, you were. <laughs> but um, that's when we identify that as cat nap. You're barely asleep because you're easily aroused. That is stage one. Stage two is um, if any of you can get yourself into power naps, which are very helpful because you do come back refreshed. But if you can get yourself into a power nap, that's stage two. 
And that's when it's harder to get you aroused. And but you do feel better after a party. That's good. Um, but the stage two, our brain really slows down, and that's why you get that power in them. Stage three and four are the beginning of deep sleep. And so if you ever go in for um, sleep studies, then you they'll watch your eye movement because that's a sign of where you're at in your sleep. And then stage three and four, there's no eye movement or muscle activity. So your that's one indicator when they look at the sleep studies. It's more difficult to wake up. It's, it's important that we get ourselves to stage three and four though, because that's when our body repairs our muscles and tissues. It's going to really grow the development, it boosts our immune system and develop energy for the next day. So it's very, very important that we get ourselves into that deep sleep in stage three and four. We need to repair our bodies. We need to get rid of the toxins. We need our um, cells to rebuild. So it's very important. Rapid eye movement sleep is, um, again, that's just part of the stages. It's about 90 minutes after you go to sleep. And that's where dreaming occurs. That is your REM sleep. Each REM stage can last up to an hour. And adults, you might have five to six REM cycles during night. And not that you need to remember this, I just wanted to kind of break it down for you. Um, if you're staying in stage one or two at that cat nap, or maybe going into a power nap, we need to get you to get to stage three or four because that's when your body will really help regenerate and rejuvenate. And also, um, this rim sleep, which remember those are the little red bars I showed you on the top, that's um, where it plays important on memory and learning functions. And because what you learn right now from this sleep talk, it's going to consolidate in your mind during the night during this rim sleep. So it's important that um, it goes into your long term memory. Dreams occur in REM. You may dream four to six times each night. And the French study found that all people dream whether we remember it or not. And muscle paralysis happens when we're dreaming in this deep stage. Remember, this is stage three and four. And um, that's why we have, if you have uh, obstructive sleep apnea, some of you may be on CPAP machines. Um, the reason why is because your muscles, your chest muscles, your breathing muscles become paralyzed and you, that's why you have these long periods of apnea and your doctor puts you on CPAP. So to keep you breathing, um, to force that breath into you because there's lack of muscle tone in your airway. And so CPAP is a very good thing. And hopefully we can get used to it. A lot of people, they try it, they don't like it, they don't continue but if you could get used to it, it's a very good thing because your muscles are paralyzed. Thank goodness our muscles are paralyzed because if you're having a dream that you're beating someone up, you certainly don't want to beat up your bed partner. They may not let you be their bed partner again. So um, that the safety feature around our sleep though is we're paralyzed. So we can't carry out our dreams. If we're having dreams like we're in a fight or we're doing something, then we um, this protects us from actually acting in on it. Again, just a quick reminder, and I'm not gonna go through this anymore, I think we've had enough of it, but um, you do fall asleep over here. This is when you get into bed, you start taking that cat nap, you get deeper into a power nap, and then you go down, here's REM where you're dreaming, go down into non-REM sleep, you go back into REM, go to longer, longer, and that's where the four to six hour uh, dreams come in through the night. <clears throat> Another way of fitting it, I just broke this down different. Stage one is very light sleep, your muscle and brain and your eye activity decrease. Stage two is the eye movement and activity stop. So you don't move, your brain waves are slowing and way down. Stage three is the brain produces very slow delta waves and sleep. Uh, if you wake up during this time, you may get disoriented. Like, where am I? What am I doing? Um, when you wake up. And then the REM sleep is when your heart, breathing, and blood pressure rise. The body is paralyzed. The eye movements are quick. And dreams begin. That's the REM sleep. 
So again, just four stages. Every stage is around 90 to 120 minutes. So I'd like to show you this video. I like this video here. Um, I can get it going. Let's see. This is a Canadian study. That's very good. I've been in and out of therapy with BetterHelp for a few years now, and it's made prioritizing my mental and emotional health so much easier. Your 20s are yeah, such a confusing time easy, in your life. Easy, You're yeah. old enough to make your own decisions, but too inexperienced to know what to say. Yeah. Every mammal sleeps, and there are a lot of theories, but... There's no real every mammal sleeps and there are a lot of theories but there's no real proof of why we sleep because it's hard to eliminate sleep and test the result that's dr william c dement one of the fathers of sleep medicine if he isn't sure why we sleep we can at least try to understand what happens when we close our eyes at night I'm at a sleep clinic about to get a sleep study done and it's going to be a two hour test. It's not going to be the typical eight hour test. So let's see what my brain says about my sleep. I guess I really am sleeping on the job. Sleep was once considered an inactive state in which our body and brain simply shut down to rest. Scientists have since found our brains are actually highly active during sleep and our brain repeatedly cycles from one stage to another. Within the first 90 minutes of falling asleep, we enter REM, which stands for Rapid Eye Movement. This cycle was only discovered in 1953. I would go in with a flashlight and there was a person would be sleeping and lo and behold, I, I would see the rapid eye movements. They're actually very easy to see if you're sitting next to the sleeper. Throughout this cycle, our brain is almost as active as it is when we're awake. Something very unusual happens. So the heart beat will be irregular, breathing will be irregular, and changes in brain temperature control in the brain occur. It's also the stage when we're likely having very vivid dreams, which is why our body is essentially paralyzed. This lack of muscle activity is known as atonia and is believed to be a protective mechanism to prevent us from acting out our dreams and getting injured. In non-REM, the body is in a much quieter state. The brain waves become slower and the eyes remain still. It's divided into three stages, N1, N2, and the deepest stage of sleep, N3. It's very hard to wake up out of N3. If, if, you, uh, if you took a 30-minute nap and somebody wakes you up, sometimes you feel lousy. And uh, that's because your brain is in a, a different chemical uh, state. N3 is also when the supply of blood to the muscles increases and the body repairs and grows tissue, which brings us to why sleep is so important. Sleep allows the, the brain to reorganize. Uh, the wiring of the brain adapts uh, in the night. There's also a role for sleep to clear out uh, metabolic waste. Junk, misfolded proteins get washed out. Including proteins that can lead to Alzheimer's disease and dementia. It's known as the glymphatic system. Think of it as a self-cleaning system that flushes away all the neural garbage clogging up our brain. While we're asleep, cells in the brain shrink by 60%, creating more space between the cells and allowing cerebral spinal fluid to pump more easily through the brain tissue. Generally, adults need seven to nine hours of sleep, typically done in one shot. But it hasn't always been this way. Evidence shows that for centuries, our ancestors had a first sleep and a second sleep. They would often wake up in the middle of the night to read, pray, or ahem, engage in other activities and then go back to bed again. This all changed after the Industrial Revolution, and thanks to Thomas Edison, the spread of electricity ignited a change in routine. Cultural attitudes shifted, uh, unleashed by the Industrial Revolution, privileging efficiency, profit. People became increasingly time sensitive. Today, a third of Canadians are not getting enough sleep. Over 25% of the population suffer from sleep disorders. And if you set an alarm clock, chances are you're sleep deprived. Setting an alarm clock uh, is uh, sending a signal to the brain to get up before it would naturally uh, tend to do so. Insufficient sleep is associated with health issues like obesity, cardiovascular disease, injuries, depression, and reduced well-being. On the other hand, oversleeping isn't much better. The world's largest sleep study held at a Canadian university recently found that if you sleep too long, it's almost as bad as not getting enough sleep. 
All this is dictated by our circadian rhythms, a biological clock that does not have a snooze button. It keeps our body in sync with the cycles of day and night and is synchronized to the rising and setting of the sun. In the morning, light sends a signal through the eye into the brain's hypothalamus to the master clock, called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SCN. The SCN then tells the rest of the body to raise body temperature, heart rate, and blood pressure. Our alertness and concentration sharpens, and our body is ready for a new day. When there's less light, like at night, the SCN tells the brain to make the sleep hormone melatonin. So you get drowsy, the organs start to slow down, bowel movements are suppressed, and the body temperature cools. For most adults, the biggest wave of fatigue comes in the middle of the night between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. The second lull comes just after lunch around 1 p.m. and 3 p.m., which is why you shouldn't necessarily feel guilty about craving an afternoon nap. But there are many ways to confuse the master clock, like exposing yourself to digital light while binging on your favorite YouTube videos before bed. Or working odd hours and traveling across time zones. So what is the best way to fall asleep and stay asleep? Letting worries and thoughts uh, go, counting sheep, uh, just kind of a meditative kind of process. And while there is no blanketed solution to get a perfect night's rest, one thing is for sure, there's no way to get around the need for sleep. <laughs> okay. I hope you like that as well. Um, so it gives a big picture of that. And you saw then there that 25% uh, of Canadians are getting enough sleep. That was a Canadian study. Um, and in the art in the United States, we showed that 30% of our population do not get enough sleep. So that just gives you um, a little history behind sleep and how important that circadian rhythm is. So sleep is a function of the brain. The body will follow what the brain does. So the brain, we sometimes think, oh, I'm so tired. My body is so tired. I need to go to sleep. But actually, it's your brain. Your brain is the chief conductor of your body. And we're not likely to sleep because our bodies are tired. Instead, we're more likely to sleep because our brains are tired. And it's time to go to bed when that happens. So again, with the, our stroke patients, sleep is critical that sleep problems may follow after a stroke. Poor sleep can slow down the recovery from the stroke and lead to depression, memory problems, and also nighttime calls, which is so important. We don't want patients falling. And sometimes that confusion during the night due to the lack of good sleep will cause falls. Um, the good news is that there are ways to improve your sleep, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Approximately 50% of patients may present with insomnia during the first few months after stroke. And one third of the patients present uh, present with insomnia for the first time. And the remaining of patients already suffered from it previously. As I said, they're looking at sleep now as a risk factor for stroke. And so a lot of people may it occurred even before the stroke happened. And something that we hopefully will be more investigative about as you uh, go to your provider. Insomnia after a stroke is usually due to environmental factors or comorbidities or other issues such as depression. And insomnia may be directly related with brain injury. Um, and the main point here is that um, the non-REM is more associated with the left side of your brain and the right, and the REM is associated with the right side. That's a little too technical, but um, we can drill down and see what is exactly what part of the brain is being affected with your sleep. Uh, furthermore, insomnia may might be a potential risk factor. As I said, I um, a study found that short sleep, which is less than five or six hours per night, could reliably predict stroke after adjusting for other co-founding factors. So a lot of research is going into this. Uh, one cohort um, study looked at 21,000 insomniacs uh, with 64,000 non-insomniacs, suggesting that the insomniac group or those unable to sleep had a 54% higher stroke than the ones, the non-insomniacs.
Um, insomnia as a prevalent clinical uh, problem indicates sleep reduction and difficulty in it. Sometimes it's starting your sleep and sometimes it's maintaining it. You may go to sleep, but then you can't stay asleep. Both of them are, are important factors. And before the diagnosis of a stroke, patients could, should provide a complete sleep history, recent physical and emotional state, um, any medications. We need to look at all of that so we can see exactly what's going on with your sleep. Insomnia is more than 30 minutes if it lasts more than 30 minutes over three times per week. So that's that pretty narrow definition of insomnia. Um, and you can't sleep for over 30 minutes, can't go to sleep, stay asleep for, for three times in a week. And if it um, lasting less or more than three months, it, it is defined either short-term insomnia is less than three months or chronic is more than three months of insomnia. For patients, uh, frequent symptoms of hypersomnia or sleeping too much are daytime sleepiness and fatigue. And the fatigue can persist for years, um, especially during the first month after a stroke. Now, here we get into the good stuff. Um, this uh, is from the CDC again. Like I said, they're very concerned about our sleep patterns. And uh, you can see the different age groups. So as a here as an infant, if you're four to 12 months, you need 12 to 16 hours per sleep uh, per 24 hours. That's because those infants or babies are growing so quickly, right? They need that. Toddlers, it starts decreasing to 11 to 14 per 24 hours. And you can see on and on, it goes down to preschool and in the 13 school age teen. Here we go, adults. Adults um, recommended sleep per day is seven or more hours per night. That's what you should be getting. Because we've gone through all those growth spurts as an infant, toddler, on and on. So now that's why our sleep lessens. But as I said earlier, it's just important that we don't have too much sleep because that's not going to help us either. So um, I look around in here, and I think we're probably all within this age group, the 26 and 54, maybe, and we're just within here. Um, looking up here. <laughs> if we're falling to this, and older adults is greater than 65, so if I'm between 26 and 64, it is not recommended to get less than six or more than 10. If I'm over 65 years of age, it is not recommended to sleep less than five or more in the morning. So if we do have that problem with sleeping too much, then we need to be just as cognizant of that or be a, a, just as aware of that as we are um, getting not enough sleep. And then I just pointed out in Kansas and Missouri what we look like. Um, so this is uh, adults who reported short sleep duration. And Kansas or Missouri is much higher than Kansas. You can see in the middle there that there is a difference between Kansas and Missouri. More people have less or short sleep during the times in Missouri than they do in Kansas. And um, the CDC will break it down by state exactly what's going on. So we do know that when you go to the doctor, um, a sleep disorder is a diagnosis. A sleep weight disturbance is an issue that is diagnosed by your uh, healthcare professional. And these are perceived or actual issues that impact your sleep quality. So, this is a diagnosis. Common sleep problems by the National Sleep Foundation are sleep apnea, as I mentioned before, sleep apnea, maybe you have CPAP. If you can get used to wearing that, you, um, your sleep hopefully will improve. Insomnia, restless leg syndrome, that's a common one too. And there are medications for restless leg. Except the daytime sleepiness disorder, when I get my days and nights messed up and I want to sleep during the day and instead of night, we need to get that switched. Approximately 80 different types of sleep disorders and 70 million Americans suffer from this. So if you do suffer from sleep uh, deprivation or too much, then you're not alone by far. 70 million of us suffer from them. A lot of times, some of the sleep problems are caused by medication side effects. 
um, depression, anxiety, pain, breathing difficulties. Now, I will say that um, it, it's very important. One of the easiest first starts is to limit your medication and make sure it should be taken. Uh, if you have excessive daytime sleepiness, maybe the medication you're taking in the morning should really be taken at night. And maybe it just wasn't put on your label. A good place to start is having your pharmacist where they pick up your drugs. Look at that to make sure you are taking your medication appropriately in the morning or at night time. Um, and are any of those summer activities. You don't want to take something that puts you to keep you awake at night time. So uh, those are something your pharmacist can very easily help you with. So what are some healthy habits I can um, have you learn today is to maintain a consistent sleep schedule, get at least seven hours each night, establish a relaxing bedtime routine, use your bed only for sleep and steps, limit exposure to bright lights in the evening, and keep the room comfortable and cool. So um, this one about use your bed, uh, appropriately, if you don't feel like you're going to go to sleep right away, then don't go to bed. What, what we want to condition your brain to is when I hit the bed, I know that means I need to sleep. It's a brain conditioning thing. So you um, need to establish a routine, stay up and read, watch TV, do whatever you want to do to get yourself down so that when you do hit the bed, um, your brain knows, oh, it's that's a predictor, that's a cue, I need to go to sleep. I'm gonna talk about each of these things too. Um, turn electronics off 30 minutes before bed. How many people, you don't have to raise your hand, uh, but you go to bed and you're looking at your phone and doing everything on your phone as you're falling asleep. That's a bad thing that I shouldn't do, but I know that I do it. <laughs> okay, sleep hygiene. So that's what we call sleep hygiene is what we need to have good sleep. Your room needs to be dark. If you, especially for those that their nights and days are turned around like uh, pilots or um, night workers, um, nurses on the night shift and uh, people like that, then you, need, you can buy those heavy curtains that will actually darken your room. There's such a thing. And if you need that, if you're, maybe your home or your apartment, whatever, has a lot of light, maybe you sleep near a drop, uh, street light or something, you can get those curtains set. We need your room dark. That's part of sleep hygiene, dark. The other thing is that uh, it needs to be cool. Now, the cool thing about a fan is not only do you get to keep your room cool, but it has that sound, the kind of that white sound that will kind of put you to sleep too. So a fan is very helpful for the sound and to keep your room cool. And again, the, the third aspect of sleep hygiene is no electronics. So turn off the TV, the phone, all of that before you get into your bed. Uh -huh. Yes, I'm going to show you. There's some apps on your phone you can use. Yes, great question. Thank you. Um, some diet tips. <clears throat> Don't eat a large meal before bedtime. If you need a bedtime snack, eat something light and healthy. Maybe protein that's going to take a while to break down. But if you leave, eat a large meal before bedtime, like you eat, you know, we be go on vacation, we eat late, we do that crazy stuff, we eat too much. And then you have parts of the sleep. Well, yes, because your body is trying to digest that heavy food. And it is going to keep you awake while your body's digesting. So if you need a protein or something light before you go to bed, it would be less energy extending on trying to break that down. Exercise regularly and maintain a healthy diet. Exercise helps too. It makes your body tired. So by the time you want to go to sleep. Avoid consuming caffeine in the late afternoon or evening. So any caffeine, that can be in your pot or in your coffee or your tea, but avoid consuming it. And late afternoon or evening and alcohol. Okay, alcohol, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I have a few years of the right to sleep yet, but you usually don't stay asleep. So the alcohol will not give you a good restful sleep because pretty soon the alcohol is something you're going to have. So try not to consume alcohol. I'm so sorry, I think I'm being here. 
And reduce your food intake before bedtime. I'm not going to show you something here that we can talk about all this stuff in just a second. Um, but if you are drinking up until bedtime and then you're up all night going to the bathroom to urinate, then that's not helping you. So try to, uh, I'm going to give you an exercise that you can look at that, try to move it up, up, up until you know when you should stop drinking so you're not up all night going to the bathroom. How can caregivers help? Caregivers can help keep that room quiet and comfortable during sleep. They can offer gentle back reps or foot massages in bedtime to get that body relaxed and the mind. Offer a light bedtime snack, something healthy like protein, like not, not a big old heavy meal, like your heart. And let the healthcare team know if the patient seems to be confused at night. We don't, the patient should not be confused every night. Maybe if they had a bad dream and patient like that. If there's confusion, be sure the caregiver needs to let the doctor know. Breathing at the core of life is breath. So our breath, our breathing is so important. And you know, when you laugh or you sigh, that's the body's natural way of getting us to breathe, breathe in deeply. So laughing and sighing, or especially laughing, that's good for all of us, right? Laughter is the best medicine. You've probably heard that before. Um, that's why we usually feel calmer after we have a good old laugh, like a belly laugh, or um, sometimes when you're sighing, you may feel more comfortable and rejuvenated after that because that is good for you. It uh, makes your body breathe very deep. Anxiety and stress can make us take shallow deep breaths, which is not good at all. Shallow breathing uh, doesn't allow enough oxygen to get into our bodies, and that makes us anxious. If our body feels like that we're not getting the air, um, that's very anxiety provoking, not not uh, sedating. And so um, I am just going to show you this four step exercise. If you need a relaxation uh, technique before you go to bed, uh, you take a deep breath from your diaphragm, and this is the muscle between your lungs and your abdomen. Hold the breath for several seconds, however long is comfortable for you, and then exhale very slowly. <clears throat> And then repeat this one or two more times, and then relax for a moment and let yourself feel the experience of being calm. So, in other words, take deep breaths and hold it, exhale very slowly, and then repeat it. Another one is meditation. Um, repetitive prayers are a form of meditation. So, sometimes people like to pray, and that is fine. Uh, like he said in the film, killing sheep is part of this. It's a repetitive thing that it's, you know, you count sheep, it's just a repetitive counting that will get you, make you so bored probably, you will fall asleep. So repetitive prayers or any kind of repetitive meditation is fine. Um, and you can do at one point to where you just say, um, peace, sleep, you know, use one word that puts you, gives you calmness. Or you can use a two-point in which you um, say a word and also focus on your breathing. Guided energy is very good. And deep breathing and meditation uh, by imagining a very peaceful theme or setting um, sounds usually come with that scene. Like if you are, get very relaxed at the ocean, then those ocean sounds are very relaxing to you or waterfalls. Also, guided imagery with yoga or tai chi. All of those before bedtime can really, really help enhance your sleep. Meditation, like I said, um, you could choose a mantra like peace, love, or hope. Find a quiet place. Do it 15 to 20 minutes. The goal is to relax your mind. And when you're just learning how to do any of this guided imagery or meditation, your mind's going to be jumping all over the place. Like we do in church, right? We should be focused, praying, and then our minds like, "What am I having for dinner?" So um, it's okay. Just guide your mind back to it, and eventually you'll get the hang of it, and your mind will stay with you. Do not try to push your mind back. Just simply guide it back. 
two pointed is called mindful rinse meditation. That's when you use your mind, as I just said, by focusing on your breathing. Again, if you jump around, it's okay. Eventually, you won't get any of it and be very focused. Now, <clears throat> um, there's a pillow out there called a dream pad that um, I'm not necessarily recommending it because it's kind of pricey. It's $149. And I haven't an experienced I haven't tried it myself. So, but it does vibrate to the beat of music. And there was some occupational therapy studies going on with this, which demonstrated that individuals who use a pill have fewer nighttime awakenings. And this is what the pillow looks like. It's just looks like a plain old pillow. And uh, that you hear these sound waves, um, or the sound comes through here, and you can see those arrows coming out of the pillow. The sound will come through, but it only comes through, you can only hear it, not your partner. So it's just where you're laying your head on the pillow. And um, but it's maybe worth a try. It's called Dream Pad Sleep Doctor if you want to take a look at that. Now, uh, uh, your question about sounds. So this is a site. Uh, if you look on your phone, um, you can go under sleep sound and you can see there's three sleep camp sounds. Here, there's calming sounds to help sleep, ocean sounds for sleeping, rainfall sounds for sleeping, thunderstorm sleep sounds, fan sounds for sleeping, wind sounds, rain sounds, nature sounds, all of these for sleeping. So you can go here and they're free. Now, sometimes uh, I'll warn you that they're free at the beginning and then they want you to pay something for it. But you can at least try it for free to see if that sound does help you. But that is on your iPhone. Now, turn the iPhone over because I just said I don't have blue lights and all that. So that's kind of tricky, isn't it? You're putting it on your iPhone, but then, or you can buy those little machines that are sound machines that you put on your bedside table and they do the same thing. And they, a lot of them now have many options that you can play many different kinds of sound on there if you want that. And now, not, then you wouldn't have to worry about that blue screen. You can go to Calm, C A L M, on your phone, and that's going to give you a lot of different options. Find your home, sleep more, stress less, live better. So that's their mantra. Um, so back to the stroke again. So medications, there are several medications that uh, are used to treat stroke that may affect sleep, um, like hypertension, such as beta blockers, uh, diuretics. So you're urinating during the night when you don't when you need your sleep. Um, so and again, uh, and also for the depression, they could be using the SSRIs, which um, has medicine in it that can decrease or have chemicals in it that can decrease your REM sleep. Again, you don't really need to remember all this. You have to check with your pharmacist. Pharmacists are extremely helpful. And see if there's something in there, in the drugs, then do they have an alternate? So maybe you're on this blood pressure medicine, but it's causing these sleep problems. So if we move you on this blood pressure medicine, you can have the same effect, but not the sleep issues. Um, so sleep aids, there are some options for sleep aids like um, the daily antihistamines like Benadryl, Aleve, PM, uh, Unison sleep tabs. The hormone melatonin is a natural producing that you can kind of boost your body by taking some melatonin in pill form. And then there's a newer herbal supplement called valerian. That's to be very good and it's a herb. But, before you start taking these sleep aids, especially Benadryl or Unison, the, you should ask the doctor or pharmacist to make sure it's not going to interfere with other medications that you're on. For instance, Benadryl, which is simple Benadryl, we can buy it at the Dollar Tree. I mean, Benadryl is Benadryl. Um, a very simple and cheap drug that we can buy on the counter, but it's not recommended if you have glaucoma, asthma, COPD, sleep apnea liver disease, urinary retention. So we think it's a very simple pill, but you should also still check with your provider and your pharmacist uh, whether that's okay to do. Uh, take it one day at a time. This, these sleep aids, Benadryl, Unifon, all of them, are not intended for more than two weeks use. If you can't get back in your normal pattern uh, after two weeks, then we need to do something different. But you should not 
be used in any of these for more than two weeks. And that would be a crutch that you're relying on, and we don't want that to happen. Um, and avoid alcohol. And be aware of side effects that influence your driving or concentration to do it. Um, and the longer you take um, the medicine, the more tolerant you are. So actually, I've known the people that did the Benadryl. Again, we think it's a very simple thing that you can buy anywhere and uh, very cheap and simple. But you do become uh, tolerant of it. So I started, you know, if you start at 25, you're going to have to buff up to 50 to get the same effect and buff up to 75. So it's just, that's why we say after two weeks, no more, talk to your doctor. It's okay to maybe have something bad happen and you need to get over that hump and you need a good night's rest to get yourself back in um, a sleep pattern. That's okay, but it's not intended for more than two weeks. Now, if you're a more of a natural person, lavender is really good. Lavender, um, it decreases anxiety and hands of sleep. There is hardly any or no side effects to it. It comes in many different forms, uh, oral tea inhibitors. Uh, they even make these lavender infused eye masks or sachets that you can, if you use an eye mask, they have a lavender right there. And electronic air diffusers for the bedroom. You can put um, lavender oil, you can put it on the cotton ball and just lay it on your nightstand 16 inches away from your nose or under the pillow. And, but you must store it in a uh, glass bottle that's tightly closed. It's very flammable. So don't, don't burn the candles to settle you down and put the lavender next to it because you'll no longer be settled for the night. Um, so be careful of that. If you want to learn more about these herbs, like lavender, or these uh, uh, herbs or um, holistic or aromatherapy, I should say, you can go to this website, which is National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy, and it's naha.org, and they go over all kinds of things and what will help you with your sleep. So this is very natural, very good. Now, um, I wanted to show you this because Sometimes, like on the 4th of July, maybe you stayed up too late and you departed from your regular schedule. How much is that going really to influence you? Or when you go on vacation or a big trip, how much is that going to influence you departing from your regular sleep schedule? Well, we know that if you have excellent sleep health, like you have good sleep hygiene, those different elements we talked about, and you actually practice that, that when you... Um, the goal line shows that when you depart from your regular sleep schedule for whatever reason, um, a bad thing happens or maybe a good thing like vacation, you are only impacted 28% uh, if you already have some uh, good sleep patterns on how you feel physically, opposed to 56% who do not have some good sleep patterns. And you can see on the bottom here how you feel physically, emotionally, and uh, how well you can accomplish things. It's much higher if you already have a good sleep pattern. So if you can continue working on that, life is good. And also feeling well rest of weekdays by sleep health status. Again, if you have uh, excellent sleep health, health you 76% feel well rested on weekdays as opposed to only 22% if you have poor sleep health. So if you ever read anything from the National Sleep Foundation or um, you get anything from them or they want you to participate in studies, they're a really good organization. They're found in 1999. They're, um, they're committed to advancing our sleep health. So they're really good. Um, Sleepfoundation.org if you want to go. And this is the last point I want to make to you. And Sarah did make you copies if you want a copy of this, because if you're having trouble sleeping now, but you don't know why, this is called a sleep diary. And I really, really like it. So here you put in, a will go to sample here. Um, this is a Monday, which your Mondays may look different than your Saturdays. So it's a Monday, it's a work day or a vacation day, whatever. And it starts at noon. So let me you know, eat and exercise. Um, because sometimes exercise is going to rev you up and you don't want to do it when you're trying to go to bed. So your exercising, that's good. A is alcohol. I'm having a, a, some alcohol drink. 16 
I fall asleep. The shaded area is sleeping. So I sleep from seven to eight. I wake up. I go to bed. That line here is at 10 p.m. if I went to bed at 10, but I did not fall asleep until midnight. I slept in the shaded areas from midnight to three. I woke up from four to five. I went back to sleep at five to six. At 7 a.m., C is happening. Like I have my coffee at 7 a.m. and I took my medicine. So this is just really good because if you uh, go to the doctor or your provider and you say, I'm having trouble sleeping, and you know, and this is a very objective information. Like, what do you mean you're having trouble? What does that mean to you? That you're only sleeping 10 hours instead of 12, and what does it mean? And so if you put this, or else they're going to ask you questions like, well, when do you exercise? Well, when do you drink in caffeine? Are you drinking alcohol before you go to bed? This will help you present objective information to your provider or your pharmacist. So we can see maybe it's a medication. So I've taken my meds at 7 a.m., but maybe that should be at 7 p.m. And that will help me because at 7 a.m., maybe I'm having drowsiness during the day. And I'm foolish in areas because I want to keep going back to take my naps. So uh, this is a very, very helpful tool. And you can try it for as many weeks as you want to. But if you are experiencing problems and you're not quite sure what's going on or what would uh, be able to fix it, this is a great way to start is to do a sleep diary. Okay. Um, I'm going to take, are there any questions now? Is there a lot of or 12? I don't want to keep you guys, but any thoughts or questions? Huh? Uh, I don't have a question, but I have an observation. Yes. I appreciate your comments on 